Good afternoon, good evening. My name is Martin Sonnewelt. I'm the director of the World Food System Center, and I'm your host tonight of our fifth and last edition of our public lecture series on agroecology and a transition to sustainable food systems. As in the events earlier, we had um, every time chosen a uh, one of the 13 principles of agroecology. And today we talk about soil health and have Martin Hartmann and Raphael Witwer with us. Martin, he is a senior scientist at Sustainable Agroecosystem Group at ETH Zurich. And Raphael Witwer, he is a scientist at Plant Soil Interactions Group at Akoskop, a research institution here in Switzerland on agricultural or food system research, I should say. Um, as always, a brief introduction, where are we? Um, what do we talk about? We talk about agroecology and we normally use the definition of the high-level panel of experts report. An agroecological approach is to favor the use of natural processes, trying to limit the use of purchased input and promote closed cycles. To have um, to minimize the negative externalities and stress the importance of local knowledge and participatory projects to, to get together develop knowledge and practice through experience, but also to connect with conventional scientific methods and also address social inequalities. And um, therefore, it's very important to highlight that agroecological approaches recognize that agri-food systems are coupled social and ecological system from food production to consumption that involve science, practice, and social movements, as well as, as a holistic integration to address at the end one of the key elements of sustainable food systems, the food and nutrition nutrition security. Oh, sorry. Let me see. I have here a big problem, but I'm back. So we talk about agroecology and we talk about a selected principle, it's soil health. And after these few words from my side, we will hand over to Martin Hartmann and Raphael Witwer. They both give us uh, an input from their work using also concrete cases they're working on. And after that, we open for a moderated Q&A session of around 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the amount of questions coming in. And as this is part of a student lecture, we will then close the public part and Martin and Raphael will be with the students for further questions and further discussions. So in order to also have a lively debate after the presentations, just um, raise your hands, you will get um, the floor, but you have also, of course, the possibility to use the chat function to um, share experiences or ask questions to the presenters. Food systems do connect to all the sustainable development goals, and it's not without trade-offs if we work on different SDGs, and we need to have really a holistic understanding when we talk about sustainable development of food systems, and also our topic today, soil health, does, do, does address certain of these SDGs directly when we talk about uh, life on land, for example, or also, of course, zero hunger. So if we look at food systems from a holistic perspective, it's also very helpful to um, remember the definition we just had on agroecology, because also there, many different aspects are directly linked to these 17 SDGs. And that's why agroecology provides a a very valid and important concept to address food systems challenges from something like soil to a larger system as the food system as such. And as I said, 
agroecology has three uh, types of, or the definition lays on three pillars. Agroecology is a science, it's a set of practice, and it's at the same time a social movement. And throughout these threefold definition, it's very key to broaden up the view and also have not only a perspective on one particular principle, but see it in a larger context of agroecology. And that's helpful. Maybe this graph can help us then also see these interconnections between these different principles. We are talking about principle three, soil health, the aim to secure and enhance soil health and functioning for improved plant growth, particularly by managing organic matter and by enhancing soil biological activities. And that's, of course, uh, a principle which directly addresses agroecosystem. It could also be um, seen as a principle which supports an incremental transfer or an incremental step in the different levels of when we talk about food system transformation and definitely has a as a farm perspective. But again, as I said, it's very important for a larger understanding of agroecology to see these single principles we talked about in the different lectures um, in, a, in a holistic, in a bigger landscape. And there we see that agroecology does address aspects from farm to societal level. And that was also kind of a bit represented in these five uh, lectures we had together with five lectures we had prior in, a, in an earlier semester. And it's now my pleasure to kind of end up this mini series with the presentation of Martin Hoffman and Raphael Witwer. And without further ado, to give enough time to those who have really something to say about soil health, I'm happily handing over to Martin and ask him for a quick introduction and then his input. Martin, thank you very much for being with us and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you Martin for the nice introduction and the invitation to this lecture series. I tried to jumpstart here my presentation. Can you see it? We see it perfectly and we hear you very well. Thank you, Martin. Excellent. Okay, well, good afternoon uh, to everyone online. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is, as mentioned, Martin Hartman. I'm a senior scientist at the Sustainable Agri Ecosystems Group at ETH Zurich. And uh, my expertise and interest is really into soil biology and more in particular into soil uh, microbiology and kind of what, what role they play in different ecosystems uh, in terms of providing important functions. So let's see if I can advance here. Okay, yeah. So the, the, the goal of this presentation is basically, first I would like to give a bit of an introduction of a few slides, but then actually very quickly move into a case study to demonstrate a bit of kind of what work we're doing um, to address you know, a better understanding of, of soil health. So let's see. Okay. Okay. So what is what is soil health? Soil health is is very very broadly defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So this is a very broad definition, and obviously one can address um, this definition by many different angles. Um, and and I will basically show you how we look into into this topic. What is very clear is that uh, soil is under immense pressure due to human activities that has been nicely summarized in the status of the world soil resources uh, published by the FAO a couple of years ago. And I don't want to go too much into detail, not to lose too much time, but it's, it's clear to, to all of us that we have many you know, threats to soil, such as soil erosion, organic carbon loss, nutrient imbalance, uh, contamination, acidification of soil, soil sealing and compaction, but also biodiversity loss. I'm not going into all these details here. Um, I think many of you know that, that we need to change the way we manage soils to basically make all in the future 
um, use of this particular resource. So we need to basically um, think about transforming um, the way we, we deal with soils. And this is also true for agriculture, right? I, I picture here basically what I consider a more traditional or I call it the agricultural system but it has been usually defined by, by rather high external inputs, such as mineral fertilizer and pesticides, has been characterized by the usage of, of heavier and heavier machines to efficiently manage these soils that have introduced also a lot of disturbance, mechanical disturbance to the soil, and quite often also using um, very simple cropping systems, usually monocrops or very simple crop rotations, also often combined with actually leaving the soils bare between um, growing seasons. And the agroecological principles basically want to address, you know, many of these different parts to basically transform um, these practices into, you know, basically a more sustainable approach. What does that mean? That does not only mean reducing uh, the inputs, that's one side, but also diversifying the inputs. So for example, to also use different uh, organic materials such as compost, but also maybe apply biologicals. We need to be more protective towards the soil. So we need to reduce the mechanical disturbance of the soil. And also clear, we need to bring in more complex cropping systems. That is not only different crop rotations, but also maybe mixed cropping systems such as agroforestry intercropping and can also um, cover cropping to basically try to diversify these systems and to bring basically back soil health um, in, in these agricultural systems. So when we look at indicators that define soil health, usually we we, we characterize soils with um, biological, chemical, and physical soil properties, as you can see on the picture uh, on the left here. Um, but when we look into current soil health assessment schemes, and this has been a review published um, two or three years ago by Lehman et al., looking into different schemes and basically how many different chemical, physical, and biological indicators are usually um, listed in these schemes. And what you can see quite clearly is that the biological indicators have been to quite some degree neglected in these schemes. And, and obviously, if we are thinking about addressing um, uh, characteristics such as biodiversity, biodiversity loss, but also climate regulation, for example, it's very clear that we need to uh, improve in bringing in biological um, indicators into the soil health assessment schemes. And this is basically the goal um, we have among other things in our group. Um, this is uh, more easily said than done because uh, soil biology is a rather complex system to understand. So here my expertise lies in soil microbiology. I would like just to quickly summarize um, important microbial functions for a agriculture system or for a plant system in general. If you want to read up more, I basically encourage you to, to read this um, review that we have published recently. But, but very briefly, if you start on the top um, left here, uh, microbes are key for climate regulation. Um, they basically balance not only um, consumption, but also production of greenhouse gases, such as, for example, methane, but also nitrous oxide. Um, then the green part, all about nutrient cycling. Microbes are very important in basically all nutrient cycles here depicted as the nitrogen cycle going from nitrogen fixation to nitrification and denitrification, therefore making nutrients available to the plant. If we move into the middle, microbes are key for plant growth promotion and abiotic stress tolerance. For example, um, microorganisms can produce uh, plant hormones and therefore directly influence um, growth of plants, but also stress tolerance. But they also facilitate uptake of nutrients such as phosphate or even water yeah, to the plant. Then we go to the, to the blue scheme. Um, they are key not only in using diseases, but actually also fighting pests and diseases. So pest and disease control and depicted here as different fungi and bacteria that can control pests such as the may beetle or the gypsy moth or the cyst nematode. And last but not least, when we go to the purple scheme there, uh, microbes are very powerful enzymatic machineries that then degrade all kinds of different pollutants such as, for example, antibiotics, pesticides or also phenols that we find in plastics. So overall, this should just basically summarize a bit. The microbes are very 
integral and important to any soil system, and in particular also the agricultural soil system. Um, addressing that complexity is a bit more difficult or for a long time has been a bit limited by the techniques um, we had available. This changed by basically advancement we have observed in molecular biology, because this has in the end really re revolutionized how we can do um, microbial ecology or how we can understand or try to understand microbes in the environment. So we can start addressing um, molecules such as DNA, RNA, or proteins to get around a better understanding um, of certain questions, for example, who is there and how many of the species we can find are there, but also what are they doing by enabling us to look at different genes or gene transcripts or proteins that we can directly extract from a soil. And this is a bit um, basic what we are doing, um, using these molecular tools to better understand what kind of microbes are there under certain conditions on what they potentially can do in these systems. With this, I would like to move to the case study. Um, and the case study, as you hear on the picture, is called the DOC um, trial, which is a long-term farming trial um, in Terville near Basel. And that is managed uh, since over 40 years by the Institute's people and Agroscope. So what is the DOC experiment? The DOC experiment has been established in 1978, primarily to evaluate the feasibility of organic farming for crop production or basically you know, crop yield. Um, but in more recent years, um, there has been much more focus on other properties of the system and in particular on soil health, how different ways of, 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 of doing basically farming on the field can change certain soil properties. Um, excuse me, this trial compares five different farming systems in four applications. And it also uses seven year crop rotation that is temporarily shifted as you can see here nicely on that picture so that we can actually compare different crops at the same time of sand. We are currently in the seventh crop rotation that runs from 2020 to, to 27. What are these different farming systems? They primarily uh, differ uh, in their fertilization and crop protection regime. So this is really a system approach, right? We have an unfertilized control in gray that is basically not receiving any inputs. No fertilizers, um, no chemicals for the crop protection. Um, basically the, the, the crop protection is only done mechanically. We have two uh, organic system, a biodynamic and a bioorganic one that receive manure of kind of different types of so composted and rotten manure. And the crop protection is done according to organic regulations in Switzerland. So that's done mainly mechanical with indirect methods, but also applying beneficials. And then obviously we have the system specific um, additions such as the biodynamic preparations in the, in the biodyne system or copper sulfate for the potatoes in the bioorg system. This is contrasted with two conventional system. One is a mixed system. Um, that's basically according to Swiss regulation where manure in combination with mineral fertilizers are applied. And we also have a purely mineral fertilized system that is often basically the case in, in, in other countries. And the crop protection is basically done according to Swiss regulations by applying insecticides, fungicides and herbicides according to these uh, thresholds. So keep be, please these five different systems in, in mind. I would like to jump directly to first um, data. The first thing obviously that we are interested in is crop yields. So these are mean crop yields over um, crop rotations here for grass, clover, wheat, and potato, and for two crop rotate or three crop rotations for soybean and maize. Um, the first thing you can see is basically that yields are, are stable in all these systems. So there's not too much variability. But what also is very clear is that there's a crop dependent yield gap between the organic and the conventional system. And that basically goes from left to right. So the rather large gap uh, of, of up to 40% uh, for potato. And this gap is basically decreasing in the order of potato, wheat, maize, grass, clover, and, and soybean. So on average, we have around 15% yield gap between organic and conventional systems across all the crops. When we look into soil organic carbon, already mentioned by Martin, this is an important property of, of soil health. 
here you see the soil organic carbon stock um, developments across the basically four decades of, of measurements. It took around eight years until we basically were able to detect the first differences and around 22 years until the first differences became um, clear in all the systems receiving manure. And this is kind of highlighting the importance of long-term trials because only then we can actually see the long-term trends of such properties that seem to respond actually rather slowly. What you can see is that these systems are diverging on the right hand side, I have basically calculated the annual change in, in the carbon stock uh, over these, this period. And what you can see is that the organic systems are basically able to raise the uh, SOC levels, in particular the biodynamic one in green with the composted manure. Uh, the mixed conventional one in, in red is somewhat you know, stable at, at zero, whereas the, the stock class systems um, the mainly fertilized system in, in yellow and obviously also the unfertilized system lose soil organic carbon. So this is already a first indication that these systems promote different levels of soil organic carbon. We can look at the soil biota with very general um, properties, for example, measuring microbial biomass or, or activity, but also looking at, for example, faunal diversity. Uh, on the left hand side, you have microbial biomass, um, carbon and nitrogen. So the first two groups there, then we have three different measurements of activity, a very general measurement, basal respiration and some specific enzyme activities. The trend is clear for almost all of these properties that we have a, a basically a decrease, a gradual decrease from biodynamic to organic to the mixed conventional and the mineral conventional system in these properties. When we look at the richness or the number of different species uh, in different groups of the fauna, this is what you see on the right hand side. This is less clear. We basically have no change of amphitrates and nematodes here. Um, we see a trend to higher richness of soil fauna um, in the organic systems for groups such as spiders, ground beetles, and, and earthworms. But the picture is, is not very clear. So the soil biota is responding to these treatments in, in some ways. And obviously now our primary interest was to look much deeper into the soil microbes, knowing that they basically fulfill all the different functions I have mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. So we use a micro approach to target genes to measure things such as alpha and beta diversity. So basically the number of different microbial species um, this is, we cannot basically just do this on a, on a visual assessment and count base. We, we use molecular markers for doing this. And what you can see is that the organic exists, uh, that the systems receiving manure, so the, the mixed convention and the two organic one, have a higher alpha diversity of bacteria, archaea, and fungi compared to the stockless systems, with the biodynamic one um, having the highest um, values. A little bit more interesting from my perspective is really how the community changed because just the sheer number of species might not be so indicative of a good soil, but actually what kind of species are there. And for this, we often use these kind of ordinations. For those of you who are not really familiar, um, um, quickly explain one data point that you see here represents a microbial community in a, in a given soil sample. And if two different samples are very close together as you can see here these two blue ones that means these communities are very similar in their composition contrasting if they are very far apart like for example the the, the red and the yellow one here this means they have rather distinct communities and what you can see primarily on the first axis we have a separation of all the systems receiving manure versus the systems receiving no manure. And then on the second axis, we have basic differentiation between conventional systems and organic systems. So it's, it's very clear that basically systems differ, all of them actually to some degree. Um, obviously, for example, the biodynamic and the bioorganic, bio we see they are a little bit closer together than the other ones, um, but they all have a more or less unique microbial community. Our interest obviously lies into figuring out now who is there and who is associated with what kind of systems. <clears throat> How do you read this network here? Each um, small circle that you see represents a microbial species, so either bacteria or fungal species, and they get connected 
to a system or to a combination of systems if they are significantly enriched in that particular system. Um, and basically among all the microbes, you could detect around 10% of the species representing half of the total detected abundance were responding to one or the other system. We can then look into what kind of species do we find. And it's indeed that in the stockless systems, um, in the unfertilized and mineral fertilized, we see so-called oligotrophic groups uh, that are dominating these communities. Oligotrophs are basically microbes that are adapted to very resource-limited environments, such as, for example, the Acetobacteria, Solibacter, and Coribacter. On the opposite, we see the cluster that is basically common to all the manure-based system. This is not surprisingly dominated by groups that are commonly involved in degradation of organic matter because we are adding manure and we see more of these like firmicutes, actinobacteria, but also um, saprobic fungi. They like to be on, on dung, for example, or in manure. They are enriched in this cluster. We can look, for example, at the cluster specific to the two organic treatments. There we clear increase in potential biocontrol species, such as Bovaria, Bionectria, and so forth. Um, kind of raising the concern or the question um, why they are um, selected against in the conventional systems receiving um, fungicides and, and, and other chemicals. And last but not least, when it, last but not least, when it comes to the um, unfertilized system, there we saw an enrichment of potential plant pathogens such as uh, Fusarium um, foma nescojita, basically showing that there is an enrichment of plant pathogens if we don't do anything, but this enrichment was not there in the organic system that did not receive these chemicals. Okay, um, we can go a step further. We know, okay, community compositions change in terms of what kind of species are there, but we know that there's a certain functional redundancy in microbial communities. That means that different species can still carry out the same function because they carry out the same gene. So we wanted to understand if changes in community composition of the species also will translate into changes in gene content, genes that encode for different functions. For this, we used a shotgun metagenome approach, a much more laborious approach where we basically try to sequence all the DNA that's in our sample and identify all the different genes that we have in these particular soils. Um, and we can do the same kind of ordination. We can say, okay, do these farming systems, the samples that are coming from these farming systems differ in the gene composition that they have. And we see the same picture, right? We have on the left, the manure-based systems, on the right, the stockless systems, and axis number two that kind of differentiates between the conventionally uh, managed and the more organically managed system. So that means that species, changes in species composition also translate into changes in the composition of certain functional genes. This is very, very complex. So I just tried to give you a very brief glimpse of, of what is in there. We can uh, group these genes according to very broad functional um, processes. Um, as you see here on the left, for example, RNA processing, protein processing, certain kinds of metabolisms. And we can basically visualize if these genes or genes in this cluster are either enriched or selected against in different systems. I try to make it a bit more simple for you, simply comparing organic and conventional systems, removing the unfertilized system for this comparison. And what you can really see is on the very top, we have an enrichment in the conventional systems of genes related to more RNA and protein processing. This is mainly synthesis of these uh, products that were basically um, yeah, enriched in, in synthetically fertilized systems. And this is contrasted by at the bottom, for example, a group called metabolism. And if we look in, in, into this group, we can see themes, for example, related to carbohydrate metabolism, phosphate and iron metabolism were enriched in organic systems. And this is basically indicating a bit into the same direction um, that actual cellular processes um, are enriched in rather limited systems on the top, but that actually then the diverse metabolism of carbohydrates, phosphates, and iron is getting enriched in organic system receiving a lot of complex organic matter. With this, I would like to, to end um, we have a conclusion that basically farming systems receiving manure, uh, all three of them, they were able to either maintain 
or even raise soil organic carbon levels, an important uh, property of, of soil health, uh, and also substantially alter soil biodiversity and activity. I think it's interesting that each of these farming systems indeed promoted a very unique soil microbiome with a specific metabolic potential, and these differences in these potentials kind of indicate adaptation to very different nutritional conditions. And last but not least, we have to highlight here, okay, we have less nutrient and pesticide inputs in uh, the organic systems compared to the conventional systems. I did not show this, um, but this is the case. And that basically leads to a yield gap of around 15%. But on the other hand, we have positive effects on soil organic carbon, soil biodiversity, for example, enrichment of biocontrol species, and we have seen a really change in the functional potential, for example, related to different kinds of metabolism. And this now deserves closer attention. So this is a rather new data set. We're looking into what kind of functions then really change across these different systems. I would like to acknowledge um, that this is a long-term um, collaboration between Fibel Agroscope and ETH Zurich that actually started for me already at my PhD and has never stopped since. Would like to highlight key collaborators, Hans-Martin Krauser, Ralph Müller, Martina Lori, Andreas Fliesbach, and Paul Matter uh, at People and Franco Wittmann, Jochen Meyer at Agroscope that have been very key to many results that I have shown here. Um, obviously, the implementation and maintenance of the DOC trial is quite a challenge over four decades to run such a system. So I would like to acknowledge the people and agroscope teams this. I would like to acknowledge the uh, facilities, analytic and computational that have produced some of these data. And obviously, many different far, uh, funding agencies have not only supported the trial, but also the data production that we see here. And last but not least, the agrico cooperative that is leasing that field for over 40 years. Um, to basically research, to do research. With this, um, thank you very much for the attention and I hand back to Martin. Thank you, Martin, for this travel into the deepest and smallest particulars of soils. Thank you very much for this and uh, a reminder to all, if you have questions or reactions, you can also use the chat feature. Raphael, I kind of ask you to share your screen and your story with us. Yes, thank you very much. I try just to share the right desktop. Okay, I hope it's the full slide mode that you see. We see it perfectly and we hear you very well too. Perfect. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad also to be able to participate, to, to be invited to participate in this uh, public service and talk about um, soil health and agroecology and the work we do in this field here at Agroscope, actually also in Zurich uh, here at Reckenholz. Uh, about me, I studied uh, agronomy at the ATH. I did my master in crop science and then uh, started at Agroscope in the plant soil interaction group and i focus mainly on the impact of different cropping practices not only on soil health and biology but more broadly on uh, the ecosystem agroecosystem and uh, ecosystem services that um, they provide I followed a bit uh, the question you asked uh, me, Martin, in your invitation. So I start with uh, the broad question of the role that agroecology can play in food system transformation. And a bit motion, a bit a personal opinion about that is that uh, this is a very good um, framework that is important because it's broadly recognized more and more and is taken over in research, politics and society, but it's not really all new. Uh, at the end, it is about good agricultural practices that were also performed long times ago, that were a bit um, maybe forgotten, but uh, still were already there. I think the most uh, important thing, this is an activity way of, of rethinking and tackle problem solution we have today. And uh, very important also, it promotes transdisciplinary uh, research and approaches uh, so that we can go on and get back a bit to more um, yeah, sustainable system. 
What is the role of soil health in this uh, concept? Um, I mean, soil is the core of all terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, it allows the living on earth. We are just um, working on the earth and uh, live from what the soil provides to us. It is the place, as um, Martin uh, mentioned, where almost all processes are taking place, biochemical, uh, that are uh, mostly processed by um, this soil biota and it contributes uh, to many of the um, principles of agroecology. It contributes to recycling. It is the biggest recycling firm of the world. Um, everything that is biodegradable can be recycled in soil. It can help to reduce inputs. So number two, it contributes to health, not only for animals, but also humans. It's uh, one of the largest uh, biodiversity on earth uh, we can find um, and so yeah it's the core of many of these uh, agro ecosystem based principle very briefly i think uh, this is also something we know um, a lot uh, this is soil is uh, unreliable resources even though uh, soil can build up, but it takes so much time that um, when it is lost, it's really hard to, to repair. And uh, yeah, it's the basis of almost all of our food. Um, it's important not only for producing food, but also uh, for nutrient cycling, prod growth, uh, water uh, cycling, and also water purification, uh, also contributing to, to health. Um, and we also heard about that uh, it's the biggest it's store more carbon that um, we find on uh, in the atmosphere and in the biomass that we can find uh, on the earth but um, we have threats to soil many related to their use uh, in an agriculture cultural context, uh, Martin also mentioned them. It is about biodiversity loss, soil organic matter decline, contamination, compaction, erosion. Um, and one of the biggest that is a bit aside of the agricultural uh, context or um, possibility to, 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 to have impact is uh, yeah, the settlement and buildings uh, that uh, cover uh, soil forever. And um, in the Switzerland, for example, it's about eight uh, soccer fields um, per day that are uh, covered with um, buildings. And uh, unfortunately, it is not always the bad or the less quality soil. It is mostly the very good agricultural soil that are around city that are lost by the settlement. And we will maybe talk about that, and I will mention that maybe later. Um, there will need really more than uh, a soil quantity um, uh, uh, saving measure, but also more soil quality uh, saving measure in the land planning. Maybe also to mention in the Introduction, soil are not all the same. Also in Switzerland, we have very diverse soils and um, they are characterized mostly through their biological, chemical and physical properties. And they can be very different um, among the landscape and also within a field. These soil properties will determine the soil function that they'll, they, and how much of this function the soil can perform and it will permit certain soil use that will then influence against soil properties. And this is really important to have in mind that these site specific properties uh, can not permit uh, whole function at all place and we have it uh, to be aware what can be done and what are the most um, important function at certain place that can be um, improved um, and also in face of uh, ch global changes like climate or substance flow that change. All those, my work and more broadly our group work here at Agroscope um, fits into the soil health and agroecology concept uh, quite good, I would say, since years. Uh, we work after the concept of soil ecological engineering 
where we try um, to either indirectly through cropping practices or directly to uh, direct microbi microbiome management or field inocul inoculation with uh, some species uh, promote a uh, more sustainable um, way of producing food. We know that um, intensive systems are characterized by high productivity in general because we have high inputs of external resources, but these resources are not really recycled or used. Uh, we stay, don't not stay into the system or are mostly lost either in the air, in the air or in the water bodies. On the other hand, extensive systems are very diverse in soil and also sometimes above ground, have a high internal regulation of these cycles, but mostly also lower productivity. And our goal is through different approach, these, these two uh, different approaches to um, improve mostly the internal recycling of nutrients by keeping high productivity or desired productivity. I would like now to just show you some examples of this research. Uh, one, um, first, uh, mostly about indirect measure, because this is what I'm mostly doing in the group. As agronomist, it's looking how cropping practices influence um, soil health and also other ecosystem uh, services. Um, again, like the dog trial, I work with a long-term experiment I'm calling the FAST for farming system and tillage experiment that is located here in Zurich uh, at Agroscope, where we compare on the long since 2009 uh, four uh, main different cropping system uh, to assess their overall performance, um, not only in terms of productivity, but also economically and uh, ecologically. Uh, we compare uh, two conventional system that are really um, similar to the one in, in the dog trial uh, for mostly the mineral treatment. Um, they get mineral fertilization, herbicide for weed control and uh, some pesticide also for plant protection. We have also two organic system that differ in the fertilization regime. They get uh, organic fertilizer with the cattle slurry. Uh, weeds are controlled mechanically and there is only biological control. Within these two main um, man management system, we have then the factor uh, tillage that comes into place, where we always compare within the commercial system one plow intensive tilt system, where uh, there is a regular plowing of the soil and uh, a conservation tillage system. Here in the case of uh, conventional, it's a no tillage system where the soil is um, not um, tilt at all, only for sowing there is a small opening to get the seed into the soil. In the organic system, we also have a plowed system, which is quite the normal uh, organic measure uh, that is applied uh, as tillage. And we have also a reduced tillage system um, here because we cannot uh, use herbicide to control weeds. We still have to till a little bit the soil very shallow uh, to control these weeds. We compare these four main system also on six year crop rotation cycle um, on the long term. And uh, over the years, we also get a lot of um, parameter that we could assess in these plots. Uh, in total, about 40 variables parameter that we assess. These are in gray. And in our recent work that uh, I published, uh, I tried to summarize this parameter in different agroecosystem services that uh, this system provide. Um, I group this parameter according to the concept um, of agroecosystem multifunctionality and ecosystem services in nine final agroecosystem goods, which cover supporting services like biodiversity conservation and soil health preservation, some regulating services like soil protection, water and hair protection, um, provisioning services, uh, productivity, food production. And because yeah, agriculture is in a socioeconomical context, I also included some economic indicators uh, into this analysis. 
when we look a bit uh, more in the soil parameter individually here in the supporting function about soil health mostly soil biology we see that um, when we go to more extensive systems that are more conservative in terms of soil uh, we see an increase in um, beneficial soil organism like mycorrhizae fungi that makes symbiosis with most almost all uh, plants on hers and provide them with uh, nutrients and, and, and water, for example. We see that their abundance and also their diversity are improved in system, either organic system or with uh, reduced uh, or no tillage. Uh, also, earthworm, uh, beneficial organisms, uh, is increased in those systems compared to the conventional intensive tilled system. And these have also an impact on the soil physical property, like soil aggregates and aggregate stability, which is also improved in those systems. If um, at the end, if I a bit summarize all these aspects that we assessed in the trial, we see clearly that this alternative system, mostly the ones with reduced tillage intensity, are beneficial for soil health. When we look at a regulating function like uh, erosion control, which is really important because we know that erosion is a big problem in uh, agriculture, or, uh, we also see there that um, mostly the system that reduce tillage intensity are really uh, efficient in uh, reducing the erosion risk. We did in situ assessment in, on the plots um, simulating rain events. Uh, during two seasons in two crops. And we see clearly that uh, mostly soil cover determines the risk of soil erosion. And uh, if we have less than 30% of soil cover, either by dead or living uh, residue and plants, uh, we get uh, quickly a high risk of erosion, which is mostly uh, happening in the tilled system. We also have to talk about productivity when we talk about soil health and soil function. Here we have also the same picture as in the duck trial. We have uh, less um, productivity in the organic system. Um, in the no-tillage system under conventional management, the yield gap is not so high uh, because there we can also apply mineral fertilizer and control pests and weeds with um, pesticide. Uh, the gap between plowing and reduced tillage in organic system is a bit higher. But if we look uh, on the long term, uh, this is, these are all the year of the crop rotation, uh, the data we have now for 13 years, we see that this yield gap is quite of decreasing also between uh, the organic and the conventional system. And the question will be, and is, if it's due to change in soil health, or either negatively in the conventional system or positively in the organic system, um, or also probably because of experience in this system, in the management that we do, that could also explain this uh, reduction in yield gap. So at the end, if we, look at all these different aspects, not only soil health, and how, but also it relates to other aspects of the agroecosystem, something that is very important also in the concept of uh, agroecology, as Martin uh, mentioned it in the introduction. We see clearly looking at this only this uh, long term experiment and this four system that no of this system can perform best in all the ecosystem services or function. Uh, uh, within their focus and boundary. So there is no system that can sustain all function at the maximum level. We see that there are trade-offs between uh, function uh, and also between the amount of function that can be derived and uh, the level uh, they, they are del delivered. We see in general that conservation agriculture and organic farming improve supporting and regulating services. Um, and for the case of organic farming, these are at a cost of productivity. And I think this synergy and trade-off and looking a bit more at different aspects is really key um, also to get forward in terms of uh, sustainable agriculture 
because we have to identify this synergy and trade off uh, in the way that we can improve them and also make clear to the public uh, where we can have action. If we summarize again all these functions in these four groups of supporting, regulating, provisioning, and these economic uh, indices that I computed, we see clearly that uh, improving uh, supporting servicing like biodiversity or soil health will have a positive impact on the regulation of soil, water, and climate, but that generally all these functions are negatively correlated with productivity. What we see is that uh, economically it's not directly linked to productivity here in Switzerland because we have our support payment system, our direct payment system uh, that remunerates some of practices that are more ecologically, ecological and just compensate a bit uh, the loss of productivity. And this observation we don't only see in um, in a field site, in a controlled field site in, in station, we also had um, evaluation on 60 farm over Switzerland in a project together with other groups uh, at DTH, the groups of UN6 also, and in Changin at Agroscope, where we see also the trade-off between soil quality and higher productivity, but very interesting there we see that there is a positive relationship between increasing soil health and grain yield on their conventional system where the soil health is generally lower, um, whereas we don't see this positive relationship on their organic and um, no-till agriculture where soil quality is already reach a certain level and uh, there are other uh, constraints that limit yields. Um, so it seems there is also a plateau at some point where soil health does have, doesn't have an impact on productivity anymore. If you go a bit uh, broader than Switzerland, we had also a project uh, among Europe in the group looking at um, crop diversification on soil quality and productivity. And there clearly from the analysis, we could see that uh, not only crop diversity, but mostly crop cover the time the soil is covered by plants uh, are explaining or improving crop yields and also soil uh, multifunctionality. So using crop rotation, cover cropping, intercropping, also lays in the rotation, something that we know since long time, but still have to be mentioned uh, are really important to keep soil health. So this was a bit the possibility to improve soil health. We know also that um, we contaminate soils with certain compounds, not only pesticide, there is also plastics and many things that go into soil. But here we also work since a few years on the impact of pesticides on uh, soil uh, life. And uh, here just to mention some results uh, to say that these pesticides are really persistent in soil. Uh, we looked at also 60 different soil, the same as I mentioned before in arable farming and veg vegetable farming under conventional management and organic. And we see that even after 20 years of organic management, we still find about five to 10 uh, plant uh, pesticide residue in soil. Um, and uh, this is quite a long time. We also have the look uh, on how this pesticide had an impact on bacteria here, 16S or fungi. And we see that besides um, pedoclimatic um, parameter that for sure have a direct impact on the soil biota and community, uh, in the analysis also this pesticide popped up as uh, significantly influencing those community. And um, most importantly, we looked also at beneficial uh, processes and organisms and how they are affected by these residues. And we see here a clear indication that the number of residue that we find uh, have a negative impact of mycorrhiza, for example, in roots of crops, and also that biological and fixation genes that we found are neg negatively affected by some of these uh, residues. So we see that, um, yeah, we have to have a look at these aspects, mostly because they are persistent in soil and also understand a bit more um, what they are doing on the functioning of soil. So to conclude slowly, I think I'm a bit off of out of time. Um, what challenges we face? 
I think we really have this conflict between preserving, improving soil quality and keeping high high yields. Um, we have to preserve soil quality for sustainable agriculture and really make use of all available practices and not focus on certain uh, fixed um, management system like organic versus conventional, uh, but really make use of all available practices. And I think also to move a bit forward, we need suitable soil quality indicators that are really sensitive and repeatable, cheap and accessible and accepted in order to um, yeah, make decision tools um, available for farmer or also for policies to make better incentive to protect the soil uh, and its quality. And what we can do, I think, in the science and also practice is just providing solid evidence and good example, mostly focusing also on explaining and highlighting the synergy and trade off that we can not have everything at the same time at the same place and make choices. And sometimes also see that we have to overcome some of the actual economic and political constraint. And most importantly for me is to raise awareness in the society through communication to unveil the black box of the soil. Um, and this we try to do in a group with a citizen science project that uh, were performed two years ago and still are an, in analysis where we wanted to raise the awareness of soil as living system. And maybe you have heard of it, of the Beweistück Unterhose or Proof by Underpants uh, project where we, uh, with the help of uh, more than 1,000 participants across Switzerland, uh, we send them underpants to bury. And as you can see, there is a very uh, large participation um, and a lot of exchange and um, interest of the participants about soil and soil quality. And also in the media, it was uh, very uh, prominent. And our good thing for us was that not only the underpants were discussed, but also always the relation to soil quality, soil life. And this is really a good example how we can a bit put this uh, thematic thema in the society. And with that, thank you for your attention. And I'm looking for, our, for the discussion or your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael, also from your side for providing some inputs and some light into the black box. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's now time to open for questions for both Martin and Rafael. As, as always, I just ask you to um, raise your hand virtually or just open your mic and address your question to either Rafael or Martin. Any questions? Then let me ask, I noted two questions. One was then partly answered already, Rafael, by you, but maybe also for you both. Um, you showed a lot of research on experiment fields, these long-term trials and so on. What can we, is it, how easy is it to translate also research into, into kind of, or do research together with farmers when it comes to soil? I guess soil are, as you said, it's very different from location site specific. So what are the opportunities, but also the challenges of doing more research together with farmers? When we're talking about agroecology, it's also, this participatory element is important. So I would love to hear a few thoughts on that from you, besides on the way. Yes, uh, for sure, it's uh, an aspect It's really important. Um, and we also um, want to do that more uh, in, in, in the future. Um, we try to do, to do this with this farm network, um, but until now it was more um yeah going to fields of farmer taking sample analyzing them um so for sure a more participative approach um is what we need 
Um, it makes for sure difficult uh, in the scientific parts to um, then analyze and take into account all this variability that we found out there in terms of soils, in terms of practices, approaches. Um, uh, but um, it's for sure the way to go. And uh, we, yeah, we are in discussion also to 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 make such a project also more with farmers, um, where specific, um, yeah, approaches or or aspects um, could be then taken into more the loop uh, scientifically. Uh, but it's always a, a question of what kind of methods, what what we want to observe. Uh, farmers are really fast in their decision and uh, development, and uh, some changes, as we see with the, the organic carbon, for example, in the doctorate, it takes years. So to follow that, it's a bit uh, really a challenge in terms of soil and quality. Yeah, maybe I can add here a bit too. We, we actually have done this. I mean, in, in the end, obviously the challenge is that you get in a, more, a lot more noise because you have the decision of the farmer, you know, that's not black and white, but it might really depend on, on the year and on the philosophy of the farm. We have done this um, in a collaboration with people in Belgium where we actually have visited farms, different, more conventional farms and different basically the requirement was just agroecological farms. So they were differing quite a lot in basically how, how they were thinking they want to make that transition. These, these farms also changed in, in the time since transition um, or the, the, the fields basically. Uh, and in the end, we did some similar analyses um, that I have shown in, in my presentation. It was quite striking that despite all these additional noise that we have seen, we still found a very clear separation that the, the soil microbiota was, was consistently different between the conventional and the more agroecological farms. So, so in the end, I think this is very important to, to go closer to reality. Um, at the same time, it obviously is, is, there are multiple challenges. First of all, is the noise. And second of all, is also then actually to find participatory farmers that are willing you know to to engage in that collaboration which we which we think has gotten a bit more difficult since covid and and the war in ukraine because we have a european project where where we basically propose to do this across 180 farms uh, all across europe and we miserably failed because we did just see not get enough feedback of of farmers interested in doing this Thank you. Bad timing. I saw, I saw a comment. Uh, thank you, Oli, <laughs> in the chat. Uh, yeah, in Switzerland, there is this uh, resource project uh, from uh, the Bundesamt für Landwirtschaft, BLV, um, that uh, include also farm networks and farmers into the project and also give space and um, money, so resources to the farmers that they can also uh, innovate on their farm and their fields um, and this is really also a way to 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 move forward uh, i had an example also in mind from uh, this uh, in, in in jura this uh, terre vivant project where they also um, within the project um, included a new um, a new a, a new possibility for the farmers with more resources with more money where they could really um, innovate as much as they want uh, with more um, without the risk to to lose too much money <laughs> because it was then um, compensated uh, because otherwise there is a yeah it's difficult for them to really go beyond certain boundaries um, of frontiers um, if, if if the risk monetarily is too high but there is good example of that that is also working really I tried to find links for both projects online. One is unfortunately only in German, it's from the canton of Solothurn, but the other is in French. So that's also site specific, multi linguistic in Switzerland. There is another question from, from Julian. Um, first of all, congratulations to both for your presentations. And then he asks since the EU has such strict 
regulations on organic food, does your work have any impact on policy and decision makers? So maybe a few examples, how do, does your work influence Bern or Brussels? Yeah, for the moment directly, not uh, not so much. I mean, about soil quality and soil health preservation, I think many things that we told and, and know already how to protect soil, uh, fight erosion. This is really long time that we know these things, but uh, politically, this is moving very slowly. So yeah, it's difficult to say, how oh, can we impact that more faster? Um, but uh, we are in contact with them. Um, <clears throat> I think it still needs more times, either in terms of um, uh, maybe for my part, when I look uh, at this uh, multifunctionality and the synergy and trade-off, uh, to to have good indicators that can be applied on farms to to show these trade-offs and synergy, also quantify them a bit more and see where we can really. Um, have impact in terms of incentive, for example, for policy. But uh, this concept, we are in contact with uh, with the offices and we want to move forward. So for sure, we try also to have impact there. Yes, same here. I can post the link in the chat um, of a European project, Horizon 2020 project that is currently running where, where I am involved. Um, where we try to influence Brussels, as you say, and and for for us the the whole Green Deal goes a bit you know in a bit of a one sided direction. Um, obviously it's very difficult. So so the goal is indeed to to compare a bit of organic versus conventional farming in all kind of different aspects, including obviously soil biodiversity as a central scheme. <clears throat> But first of all, these regulations differ quite a bit across different countries, as we have uh, learned during the first phase of the project. Um, and, and then obviously, much more than, than soil health centric properties have to be taken into consideration when we talk about sustainability and the link to organic farming, for example. In the end, if we want to, if we need to produce, for example, manure, um, where is this manure coming from and what does that mean for, you know, for example, emission of greenhouse gases and so forth. Um, so, so this is a very complex system uh, and, and policymakers are desperately seeking data, you know, that supports one or the other way. So, so in that project, we are indeed trying to, to influence that a little bit, um, at least. Thank you for um, your answers, but also for sharing the links. Um, are there, is there any other question in the room? Yes, Zoe, please. Hi there, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. All right, all right. Thank you all for a wonderful presentation and uh, appreciate being um, here with you all. So, um, I wanted to ask, Raphael mentioned um, in one of the last slides that the yield gap between, in your system, between the conventional and the organic system is decreasing over time. And that might be to do with the conventional soil health declining or the organic soil health improving, or maybe some other changing factors in the management. I'd, hopefully I'm saying that back right. Um, I was interested to hear each of your thoughts on that. And in particular, Martin, if you're also seeing that in your system, and if so, what you think the mechanism might be. You want to go first, Rafa? <laughs> well, we, we, we I really- I think it was addressed to you if you see, observe the same. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let, let me answer. I, we don't, I mean, what we see is really that these yields were very crop dependent, right? For example, Growing potato organically is just something quite difficult. And then if we put on top something like reduced or no-till, then it becomes a very difficult challenge. So for the potato, we saw a yield gap of around 40% between the conventional and the organic systems. And that remained pretty stable across the six, seven-year crop rotations. So that for a long time didn't really improve. Whereas for other ones, uh, for example, mentioning soybean, there the yields were pretty much on par without any any yield gap. So in the end, I think it really depends on on the crops and probably then also to design crop rotations 
towards this. Um, but but obviously, I think also um, crop varieties get more and more adjusted to you know organic farming, and so I think there is also still a lot of potential actually in, in the breeding for crops that that are better designed for organic farming. Yeah, I can agree on that. So it's really crop specific. This is something that we see in the first trial. Uh, yeah, it's the question really, can we relate that to soil health or not? This is not answered now. For sure, the main aspect also change or improved management of the system and organic reduced yield management is not something that is established and uh, works very well from the beginning, like conventional agriculture that we know. Um, so this is something also that can explain that. Um, and yeah, the whole discussion about yield gap is, I think it's important to have it in mind, but it's also important to decide or to, 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 to yeah, say what is the yield that we want to have. And then it's a different question to what to compare this yield gap. And this is maybe more a societal and political decision. But uh, this is, yeah, something that we sometimes forgot when we always say, okay, this, uh, this cropping practice is organic management or something else, have a yield gap, it decreases yield. Uh, yes, for sure, if we compare to something very, yeah, artificial and high productive that we, that we uh, know, but we have to think about uh, to what, what we want uh, to produce at the end and to which extent. Maybe just to add here, it's not only crop specific, it's obviously also very site specific. So the dog trial is, is on a soil that's very, very fertile, you know, and it's basically good, good, very good uh, water storage capacities and so forth. And, and so there we basically, yeah, if it's, if it's already a fertile soil, then it's, it's, it's we, we didn't really see a degradation in yields over 40 years of conventional farming. But obviously, that might be very different if we have a soil that's much more prone to degradation. Um, for example, soil organic carbon loss, even further uh, erosion, so forth. Then, then we might actually see that trend even even clearer. So it's not only crop specific, but obviously also site specific or soil specific. Thank you both. Is there a last burning question around? This does not to seem to be the case. So with that, I really want to thank Raphael and Martin for being with us. I want to thank all of you joining us at this lecture or at another. And um, we, even though we don't know yet how in detail, but we are pretty confident that we will um, invite again at the autumn semester, there is again a lecture on agroecology um, um, for students at ETH and we think of in one form or another to continue with these public lectures. So stay tuned if you want to learn more what we do or what uh, our members do, stay in contact with the center and maybe we see each other in a few months again in similar rounds. So thank you very much. Um, I now invite the, the non-student participant to uh, wish you all a nice evening and uh, the students please remain here and we have some time with Raphael and Martin. Thank you. Goodbye.